This podcast goes right to the heart of the story. You know them from the shows that I've put out on Lost Cities and things like that. Joe and Duncan from Visual Skies, the team behind all my drone work where we go out and scan through the trees and lift the veil of time. But today we might also hear about the next evolution of LiDAR and what we'll be able to see beyond now. LiDAR. LiDAR, LiDAR, LiDAR. What? Oh, wait. LiDAR! Duncan, incredible guy. Joe, incredible guy. These are my friends. These are my colleagues. These are people that I look up to for the pioneers of a field that merges Hollywood, technology, and exploration. This is Visual Skies and the LiDAR story. Behind the scenes, from what you've seen on Lost Cities and beyond, let's go to the LiDAR. At that moment of near disaster, and with difficulty, kept my understanding of chimpanzees in the wild. It was for us the pleasure of discovering. Joe, you've you've been with me on almost every expedition, uh, you know that I see on TV of us, uh, you know, and Duncan as well. You guys are the Visual Skies team extraordinaire, some of the world's leading experts in spatial spatial media. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. And and really, my you know the the truth is, you guys are my lidar go to crew. So we're gonna get into all these things today. We're gonna talk about you know how it got started with us, the sixteen plus Pelly cases that we dragged through the jungles, the secret behind uh, Duncan's desire to cuddle you in the middle of the night in a tent somewhere. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe you guys can keep that to yourselves. The um. <laughs> the the technology we use, but also at the end of this, I really think that we owe it to our audience to reveal what we think is probably one of the coolest. I don't, you can decide for yourself, but what we think is the coolest discoveries that we've made along the way using the technology that we've dragged into these remote places. Um, and some, to be honest, some of the coolest discoveries have not made it to the TV screens, I would say. Uh, the last one in particular had some pretty incredible stuff in it that you know remember that triangle that okay we'll talk about that later that that comes at the end of the podcast right well but, i'm not i'm not actually in, oh sorry albert but i'm not entirely sure what's in each episode yet because it hasn't reached the uk yet you know i'm still waiting to see it on disney plus you know for some reason ooh. it's uh yeah there's a bit of a hiatus here over here in the uk and seeing your show and so you know, no spoilers no no spoilers <laughs> Okay, well, let me just tell you, there's these two guys, Joe and Duncan, who come on every <laughs> expedition, and they're just, you know, they're, they they make the show, man. That That's the spoiler I'm going to say right now. While they we get into... They bring the bad, the bad English, um, bad English humor in a way. That's what we bring. <laughs> yeah, I was worried about that, you know, but, you know, usually <laughs> not in the podcast. Usually in the episodes, we have that edit button where we can drop all your jokes to the cutting room floor. Here, we don't have that luxury, so... This well, is a much we, riskier expedition. Yeah, we require a lot of editing, I'm afraid. Um, you know, <laughs> making this look beautiful and... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, but you guys are in the movie business. I mean, that's how we met in a way, right? I had been using LiDAR, um, you know, experimentally with Tom Garrison in the jungles of Guatemala. We were trying to drag it into the middle of these excavations or fly it on a balloon. We were trying to figure out all these different ways of doing it and doing it in a way that we could be remote and 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 also not spend millions of dollars flying a you know a Cessna with all the heavy equipment around. We wanted to find a way of getting it onto drones. And then we looked around the world and we said, who's really doing this? And from my perspective, that's how we discovered the incredible Joe Steele and Duncan, and Visual Skies as a whole. But maybe you can tell the story from your perspective um, and you know where you guys were coming from before all this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, our background, as you mentioned, Albert, is in the visual effects industry. You know, we work on Hollywood blockbusters, scanning everything, you know, from massive landscapes, to, um, to people, to props, to swords, you know, guns and tanks and, you know, horses and, uh, you know, everything down to a penny. We digitize assets so that the visual effects department 
can recreate but massive battle scenes or worlds that don't exist already so we scan in places like iceland and you know jordan and all over the world capturing these landscapes in as high detail as possible so that they can recreate you know the the magical sort of visual effects that you see in the in the movies that's how it's made so we capture the reference and the 3d environments and then they lay digital actors that we've scanned as well onto massive battle scenes in 3d and so yeah essentially what we're doing is capturing things that are real and turning them into a digital asset a digital thing yeah, and these are things that i think a lot of people have actually seen you know the viewers of this podcast probably have seen some of your assets that you guys have scanned in movies like Napoleon. Uh, what else? Uh, you've you've done Game of Thrones. You're, yeah, and House of the most... Dragon. Yeah, so a lot of films, a lot of films that you would you wouldn't necessarily think have a high level of visual effects. We've we've provided assets to like the recent Bob Marley biopic. All of the crowd scenes in that are you know digital scans, and we scan venues so that they could recreate all of those scenes of, around the European tour. And so all of those scenes, a lot, a lot of them are a composite of real actors and and digital backgrounds, and digital scenes. And so wait, it's, it's wait, the wait, beauty. wait, wait, so, gone. <laughs> so you brought the Bob Marley vibe to that movie that we're about to see that's gone super it, viral all over TikTok and everything like that. that it's one an that... amazing, it's an amazing film. It's just such a good story and it's wonderful to be a part of it. You know, we are a small part of it. There's a massive production, you know, we're talking thousands of digital artists, thousands of, you know, people on set. And, uh, you know, our, our job is essentially the link between the physical world, which is what they're shooting on set, and the digital teams in, in, who work, you know, to recreate any element that they couldn't shoot. Uh, for real you know like massive crowd scenes you just can't do these days and so that's where we come in to create the digital people and the environments to put them in so like for example this cat if I, if, yeah. if I wanted to get this cat into the Bob Marley movie all you'd have to do is scan it using the same technology we take into the jungle and the next thing you know my little cat could could be in the movies yeah that's just that's dropped right. in yeah. digitally of course, yeah. That's, cats are actually very difficult to scan because you can never get them to stand in the right pose. <laughs> <laughs> the cat wants to join the podcast. Yeah, look, look. <laughs> nice. It's if cutesy. it was a digital visual skies cat, it'd be a You'd lot. Do whatever you want, <laughs> right? Yeah, All exactly. right. Get, so, okay, this cat needs to needs to go be digital somewhere else for a second, but. But you're you were, uh, you were asking um, Albert how you know we sort of uh, got connected with the Lost Cities show, and I actually have a screenshot of the data that got us the work on Lost Cities, which right, is like such it. a such a pivotal moment for us, you know, because somebody saw this image of our scan and and recommended us to the director of Lost Cities season one. Let's see. Um, let's see this game because I remember see. that moment beforehand when they're trying to link us up as a team, and I was, uh, yeah, I wasn't so sure at the time. I was like, well, who, you know, <laughs> who are these guys? <laughs> how, how can we rely on Hollywood? Because I had all these yeah. students, I had all these archaeologists, I had all these engineers trying to figure out how to fly lidar in the jungle, and then, yeah. uh, and then all of a sudden, one image, a single screenshot made this yeah. team come true let's see that one image it changed everything uh, before you do it let's let's get a little drum roll before you actually do it because part okay. of what we're experimenting with right now is is you know and i, I do this in other podcasts is, is that one image can change everything uh you know for me there's been one or two images in my life that have shifted all things in my mind and you just said it yourself this one screen image got you and i together so let's Let's see it. Drumroll, please. What is the one image? I hope we're not building this up too much because it is just a screenshot. But let me let me share. Can, can you guys see that? Okay. Oh, yeah. So this is a scan of a Sky TV series called Sky Britannia. Um, this is a Roman fort that we scanned. And uh, it's a very, very low resolution resolution image. This was captured, you know, like 2017. And I don't have the data anymore. Sorry, I'm trying to not zoom around but it's not working uh don't have the data anymore i'm oh, sorry let me just fix this ah it's not working <laughs> just so everybody knows out there this is the there biggest problem i have with joe in the field is that when he wants to see things in three dimensions he's just constantly just poking at the data swinging it around <laughs> twisting it to the point which you feel like you're about to vomit from you know some kind of seasickness 
but this is actually quite incredible. What are we looking at here? You know, I I think I know what we're talking about here, but what are we looking at from a spatial data standpoint? Yeah, it's really hard to see, but essentially what we're looking at here is a point cloud of data. Yeah, that was a really serendipitous moment. Um, so um, a, the director of Lost Cities Series 1 just by chance was going to visit a post-production house that was also working on um, some data that we had delivered. And it was just in the corner on a screen. So everything was super nda at the time, of course. But um, uh, it was a, a 3D model of a Roman fort that we scan for a TV show called Britannia. And um, the director walked straight over to it and was like, that's exactly what we need in the show. And the image that I'm showing here at the moment on screen is just a screen grab of that data. And that data, the data is showing a point cloud uh, which represents, you know, the shape and the texture of the of the environment. And you might just make out some little squares, um, white squares, in the air well they're essentially drone images so we use we captured this location with uh, what's called photogrammetry and lidar scans and that enables enables us to um, rebuild a perfect you know pixel perfect 3d model of a landscape and the director was like that's exactly what we need to do in the show and that's what got us the job on lost cities and so i'm very grateful for for this job <laughs> Well, I, I'm grateful too that he saw that. So, the, so the director you're speaking of is Mike Slee. He's an incredible guy. He was uh, the series director on Lost Cities Series One, which I think the first episode we all met in person on. And Joe, it was your brother who showed up in your place for that moment. Was uh, in Accra, Akko, the That's city right. that holds uh, the secret story of the Knights Templar. And uh, and all of their world and their treasure that was hidden in the ports and the tunnels that they moved all their treasure through. But that was the first time that Mike, you, you know, Visual Skies being you, uh, and I got together. And I and I have to admit, like I said a little bit earlier, I was pretty nervous at the time. I had, um, you know, up until that point, the lidar work that had been going on was was pretty heavy lifting. I mean, we were working with uh, government organizations that were flying huge planes or smaller planes with big heavy equipment around. We were trying to figure out how to reduce the size of this equipment and and get it more mobile so we could be on the ground in the jungle flying these things. And I didn't, you know, when they said we're going to find this, we found this team that does stuff for for Hollywood films and big movies. I thought to myself, well, how are they going to do the scientific part of this to a level that's, you know, of our standard, right? Because it's not just about capturing the data. It's about processing it in a way that can give you a scientific insight. Um, but you guys not only were able to do that, but then when when I was like, okay, well, let's figure out how to put this into an augmented reality thing where I'm, when I'm flying over the helicopter, you know, over the over the jungle, I can look down like a window into the through the trees and see what's beneath the trees. You guys just, you know, you drank some coffee, maybe some Red Bull, who knows, maybe some of that coca leaf tea, and you hacked away on your computers all night long, and boom, the next thing you knew, we had it. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. For me, you not only met the expectations, but you blew them away and went, went way beyond. Yeah, thank you, Albert. Yeah, it was, it, we, you know, you were nervous, but so were we. We were very nervous as well. But luckily, um, Duncan, who's about to join, his background is actually in archaeology. And so with us as a team, you know, even the team that I have in the office right now, we, we're very diverse in terms of, you know, our, our career backgrounds. Um, you know, I came from the visual effects world. That's my world, right? But uh, Duncan Lees was an archaeologist for um, 20, 20 years. Wow, we literally just, we dropped the Duncan Lee was an archaeologist for 20 years. And then, boom, you just appeared like, uh, I don't know, like like this was choreographed somehow. Who knows? <laughs> like a genie but you know like so duncan welcome to the show duncan uh, i've missed you buddy it's been you know it's been i don't know what like eight nine months now since uh since we were running through the jungles of of mexico and chiapas and we were canoeing across that sacred lake and and somebody had found some strange magical you know stuff in the jungle that uh anyway 
and then uh and there was uh there was a, a bunch of scanning that was being done and and we ended up finding something quite special and at the end of the podcast for me this has been probably the most incredible discovery of all of the series and and maybe maybe you know all the time that we've been together uh the different things that we found there i want to show some of the stuff that didn't make it to the show because they're i don't know what they are uh but before we get there we're trying to get through how we met uh you know what it's like to be on lost cities got a little bit of the story about uh why why the film industry where you guys are from and exploration really could merge together and then and then we just want to hear some of your 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 crass edited unedited jokes duncan because you know in this podcast unfortunately <laughs> yeah well because it's always you isn't it i mean you're always the one that says something Completely inappropriate. And I see Joe turn to you and say, "You can't say that, Duncan." I mean, every <laughs> every expedition. The truth is, he actually primes me to say it, and then then he blames me afterwards. Yeah, right. I'm PC control these days <laughs> for Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> I have had to okay, rein how... it in quite a lot in my senior position. But... How many? What's the first memory you guys have of working with me? How many years ago was that? I think that was something like, I don't know, what five, six. Seven years ago? Yeah, 2018, 2017 was that when we got started in, in Israel. Um, but yeah, we didn't actually get to meet you as uh, you were just um, dis um, discussing, Albert. Uh, it was my little brother, Francis, who uh, who got to meet you first. And so we only got stories back about, you know, what you were like. And, uh, you know, he said you were uh -oh. an awesome guy and, uh, uh -oh. you know, a bit a bit, <laughs> bit hesitant uh, about, uh, you know, the, the technology that we were bringing to the table. And, uh, you know, he had to convince you here and there. But, uh, all, yeah, all, all came back good. But the first time we actually met you was in um, Micronesia in that beach bar um which is not a beach bar it's sort of like what was that bar called what was that bar called that ser served the best fish the bar and yeah it was so nice i mean this I think is how it was long the, it was i think it was the waterfront wasn't it which seems it like a ridiculous yeah. thing but yeah it was oh, oh the my best, god the best sushi what in an the world. expedition okay yeah, just yeah, so everybody knows that was season one micronesia the story on namadol we're talking about a restaurant here but we're talking about an island that is remote i mean it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It takes, no matter where you are in the world, it takes something like, I don't know, how many hours did it take us to get there? You're flying... Yeah, 40 hours, 40 hours for us from the UK, which was crazy. No matter where you're from. Uh, and yep. yet when you land on this island, it's paradise locked in time. It feels like, you know, you're in some kind of, I don't know, some kind of made up world where everybody in this one little island knows each other. They're all... They're all this little small community that cares for each other. And then there's one bar slash restaurant right on the waterfront where everybody goes. And even while we're there, we met who would become that week the president of Micronesia and hung out with him and his brother, who was our who who rented us our car. Uh, <laughs> yeah, basically, basically what a everyone, that was the first everyone, time we met. Everyone yeah. we worked with was in that was in around that bar. I hasten to add that saying that we met in a bar makes it sound like all the locations we go to are massively glamorous when of course they really aren't. That was kind of nicer than many of the places we've ended up. Yeah, but Joe and I were kept away from you. I don't know whether that was your decision, Albert, but we were kept away from you for for Israel and then uh, and then Colombia, the first Colombia program we did on the first series. So yeah, we actually met oh, in, no, we were in Micronesia. In no, we didn't get to meet in Colombia. You, uh, uh, we did the scanning beforehand and then handed Sasha the um, um, PD. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the data. Literally, I, I have a good story about that. We were up for like almost two weeks preparing that data because there was some helicopter data as well that we were integrating and they were delayed giving it to us by like two or three weeks. And, oh, yeah. Um, Let's, do we have a so, picture of that helicopter? Let's see. I think there's a picture of the helicopter with the cameras that we had mounted onto that's that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And So let's pull that up because that was a so, unique one. Yeah. So I finished the app like an hour before um, Sasha went to the airport and I jumped on my motorbike at full speed, drove like over to his house and met him as he was getting in the taxi and I handed over the iPad and all of the data and I was like, good luck, bye. And he got, on, got, got in the taxi and went to the airport. This was a particularly unique situation because Columbia, where we did uh, a story on the the lost city, Ciudad Perdida, it's, it's 
it's situated, this city is situated in one of the most steep um, coastal mountain ranges in the world, I'd say, right? Like it's, it's, it's incredibly steep. And so you guys were able to mount the LIDAR camera pointed at all these different angles on the front of the helicopter so that we could get at some of the sides of the mountain where usually we're just looking straight down. And that was, that was pretty unique. But did you say that you literally jumped on a motorcycle 40, 40, a half an hour before our producer was getting out into the jungle to meet me with the process data and you it handed him so the It was so down laptop. to the wire. It was so down to, to the wire. And that night I hadn't slept at all. We were drinking Red Bulls all night and it finally finished, finally finished like one hour before, before Sasha was due to leave. And yeah, I jumped on my motorbike, went straight over to his house, data in, the, in my rucksack. And uh, yeah, it was down to the wire for sure. But, uh, I think that's yeah. every single one of our expeditions. I feel like that theme of of down to the wire, like you could call this Lost Cities or Lost Cities Revealed or whatever you want to call it, or you could just call it down to the wire. Because every expedition is like the night before, I see you guys hacking away in the jungle. Like we'll be in a hut somewhere, you know, and it'll be one o'clock at night and the generator is keeping the whole expedition up because you guys are processing away. And then, and then all of a sudden the next day it's like, you're sweating bullets and somebody comes running in with a thumb drive and they're like, okay, we got it. We got it. We found it. You know, <laughs> the right jeopardy the is second. definitely real. Uh, Duncan, you, you're talking about this all. You know, I was going to say it's, it's, um, in a way we all, we all know that the show beautiful as they are edited beautifully as they are really doesn't, um, get across the amount of work that goes on both behind the scenes before the trip happens. And then, during the trip itself and and we've talked about this a number of times I'll have you me and Joe but in many ways some of the real you know there's real jeopardy like it's not it's not staged for the camera the the amazing places you go and the amazing places you take us but there is also a a whole heap of jeopardy for Joe and I like you alluded to there with the processing side of things because you know we're we're working with people who've worked in these some of these environments some of the archaeologists they've worked there for years and years and years and we we turn up and do you know a, f a few days a few weeks here and there of, of data capture and then and then it's all kind of down to us three to look at it and see what we can produce out of it and see what's there we never make anything up you know it's all it's all you know valid scientific data but the jeopardy is i mean it's i think it's probably shortened joe's and my life by quite a few months just that the horrible feeling of you know what computers are like and you know what all technologies like and you know what trying to run a gen you know, run, a, run a scanner and a generator up a four thousand meter mountains like it's just it's just, sometimes the sometimes we sit there thinking why on earth have we said we'd do this because it is it is <laughs> well, absolutely don't ask that question too much let's just keep going let's just keep doing it <laughs> exactly. because it's i mean it's also exactly. incredibly fun right like yeah we get, we get really real, looked after yeah, all the and, locals and the fact, look after us so well. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, and honestly, the the communities like like that time we were in the Chachapoya Mountains, and and when we brought that data down after we had seen all those new cliffside burials, um, it it was it was uh, you know like that moment right there. Like that's why I think this is not a job, right? Like this is a this is much more than a show. This for me, this is a life journey but when i when i look at this image and i see juan and his entire community looking over our shoulder and seeing for the first time the burial of their ancestors that they didn't even know you know some, some that one remember that cave back there with all the bones that were you know like yeah it, you know and and there was and juan started crying i mean i i started cry, I, I i got really emotional the director as I, well here started crying as well you know this was a magical moment for me as well you know it's, it makes us so happy when you know other people who don't know much about this uh, you know are scanning and technology you know see something and it means something to them straight away it's really really emotive to uh, myself and duncan i imagine you know to you know get rewarded by uh, you know it's, populations like this seeing something and you know really enjoying it and like learning from it as well it's uh, but, it but, but more than learning from it why 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 do you think it made all of us emotional why why would it make you know three or four of the people in that room start crying when we're looking at pixels? Uh, it may, it's it's one of the most emotional kind of days at work i've ever had and i've and i'll tell you something albert we 
we're not used to getting instant feedback, if you like, on things that we do. Joe and I, you know, work in a process normally that takes weeks, months, years for things to be seen. So, you know, that was within a day or two, Joe, was we were shown the results of, of the, the work we'd all done up there. And the thing about the local people is that you, they, they will never fake anything, right? We, we can't say to them, act like you're happy or act like you think it's amazing. It, they're genuinely usually looking at us as though we're barking mad so when we got that reaction where they <gasps> they all kind of just were shocked at how amazing the results were and how beautiful and and how how much it touched them i think they have a much clearer sense of their links to the past something that lots of what you know western european and american people have lost that t that link to their past and they really felt it was looking at their family and i think that. You know, if we go to a graveyard and we look at our family's graves, it makes us emotional. When my kids go and see their mum's grave, it's it's incredibly emotional. And it was the same for the people in the village. They were looking at their families, in essence. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, um, that's a good point, you know, uh, Duncan, is that, is that we, you know, we all face in humanity these, these questions of our impermanent and then we see in the faces of those who came before us a mirror into our own you know into our into our own humanity right and uh and in the case of the mummies that were you know the sarcophagi that were on top of that cliff in the chachapoya episode of the last season you know there those those sarcophagi have faces painted onto them and and it's almost like you know yeah right the, yeah wow right um so this is this image right here was taken right above the village, you know, maybe two days uh, trek above the village, or I think it was two days, right? Uh, that Juan and that family, you know, that whole community lived in, and that it, the people that are entombed within those statues were the Chachapoya, the Cloud Warriors, and if you go back to the other other image of everybody staring at the data, those are the descendants of those very people, the cloud warriors. And, you know, I mean, for me, um, it's funny. People often ask me, it's like, okay, you know, how does this make you feel? For me, I feel close, almost united. Like it doesn't matter who or where you're, it doesn't matter where you're from, actually. It doesn't necessarily matter what, you know, what, what culture you come from and everything like this. We're all part of the same human species, right? So we're all part of this same shared story in some way or another. It actually exists within us because the people on the side of that clip and the people who are staring at this now, they're part of the human journey that actually is within all of us. So, you know, when I see them crying and getting emotional about this, and I feel myself getting emotional, I feel closer and more united to a global humanity than I think I, I you know, ever really do. I don't know if you feel the same way, Joe. I don't know why. Did you start? You said you almost started crying. I don't know. Like, like what did it mean? Yeah. You, you know, um, we go out to, you know, all, all areas, all locations all over the world and we scan things. Right. And the magic for us and, you know, for, for a long time, why we've been so excited about scanning is is when you collect all of this data, you know, you process it on a computer and then you see it come to life. It's a, you know, it's a magical moment where, you know, you've been at this location all day and all of a sudden, you know, on a computer screen or, you know, in, in augmented reality or virtual reality, all of a sudden you can go back to that location and see it again. It's, um, it's you know, it's a wonderful feeling. And to be able to, you know, reveal, you know, areas of uh, El Tigre, the mo mountain we scanned, to you know locals who had never been able to get up there themselves you know as if they were standing in front of it was just was was awesome it was a really like you know it's a big moment uh for me to be able to do that for you know this community who um allowed us access and you know were gracious enough to you know support us in this endeavor to you know to capture scans essentially on our side right yeah i yeah. think the big i think um, the big difference sorry to jump in guys i think the big difference is that um the work we do with you, Albert, we really are interacting with people. I mean, the the, the science that we're doing, uh, and the, the the you know the, the the digital work that we're doing, the places that we're going, um, are are a are a, a, a sort of a gateway to interact with people, local people, and a lot of what Joe and I do in our other kind of scanning worlds are 
you know we're we're enjoying the data we're enjoying the work amongst ourselves and and although we're doing it for clients there's not really an emotional tie in to that work even in feature films and they only, well, they only I, mean, slight... I think also also in feature yeah, films on. you can sort of plan it right like you can say okay we're yeah. going to process the data until we're ready to go and then once we get the data we sort of have a plan and we can and we know we're going to be able to present something like we were saying earlier these expeditions are real. This is probably the highest risk TV show to make, um, you know, in a lot of ways out there because every time we show up in the jungle or in the desert or, you know, in a mountain, we don't know if we're going to be able to deliver at the end of the episode. We don't know if we're going to find anything. We actually really don't know. So when you're looking at an image like this with all the people surrounding us, you know, or any of these other images, we're seeing, I'm seeing the data for the first time. You guys have probably seen the data and processed it for, you know, five hours before, or maybe even half an hour before, right? But every I've single time- I've got a really good, sorry to jump in now, but I've got a really good image that sort of articulates, you know, uh, the stress and the jeopardy of preparing this data in, um, in, in uh, you know, intense in the fields. Just so everybody knows, I don't know what the image is yet, but I'm sure that if we had a scratching sift next to it, it would smell pretty bad. You know, we're, we, yeah. when we're... <laughs> so we were, so the, the images that are about to come up, you know, we were literally sleeping in this tent by our computers, me and Duncan, and oh. I was fighting him in the middle of the night, trying to get him not to hug me, roll over and hug me. Yeah. And, He's <laughs> just a big bear. He nice. wants to hug everybody anyway. So, you know. I'm, I'm, Some, blaming, the slope. I'm bl yeah. blaming the slope. He says yeah, right. I was trying to hug him, but I was just rolling down a hill. I've got to admit, which... sometimes it was quite nice because it was freezing cold at night in Peru. <laughs> you know, you're oh, getting which one sunburnt is this? in the day. Yeah, field work. Can you see the photos? Yeah, yeah, but, but which expedition is this? This is in Peru. This is in Peru. Yeah, we, we've been to Peru series many times one. together. Which one? Series one. Series Wata. Yeah. Wata. Yeah. yeah. That's correct. Oh up man. Okay. Okay. Context here, guys. Wata is at a high altitude. We're talking nearly what was it? Nineteen thousand feet of elevation, something like that. Or no, it was no, like sixteen, seventeen thousand feet of elevation. Everybody got altitude sickness at some point. Um, I think, or people started to. We had a lot of coca leaves to try to keep us oxygenated, but. Uh, but it was freezing cold. Let's just put it that way. This is one of our first uh, big mountain expeditions. We had we had started finding uh, burials high up on the side of a mountain. Our uh, one of our one of our Sherpa, you know, one of the guys that I was trekking with a lot of our gear up, our porters. He ended up turning out to be a shaman because you know we realized that he started doing all these rituals every time we'd find another body or another remains of a, of a skeleton up somewhere on one of these burials. But at the top of this ridge, we were looking for, uh, you know, the, the, the city of a people who came before the Inca, the people that would then become the Inca hundreds of years later. And they built this world, what we thought would be this world, way high up in the clouds. I mean, when you look at a place like Machu Picchu, that's an example of something that came after examples before it. And the ones that came before it, they were up in the clouds too. Uh, and it's cold. It's, I don't know, how cold do you guys think it was? Like, what it's do you think? Minus five, it, minus five in the in the nights. And uh, yeah, which isn't too cold, but it is when it's like, you, you know, 25, 30 degrees in the day. And, uh, and we so, had to yeah. trek how much gear up there? I mean, how many pelly cases we bring up there? Oh, I've got, uh, yeah, I've got an image of that, but it was 16 pelly cases on the back of donkeys 16. and horses. But it's, oh, yeah, they found the images. It's great. So there's, a, there's one Pelican before cases. this. There's an image before this, I think, um, which um, shows Duncan really stressed and all of our computers. Duncan, you look exactly. You, you're wear, are you wearing the there same you clothes? I think you're wearing the same clothes <laughs> now. No, I, I, I have hastened to add this is a different set. I do have more than one set of clothes, Albert. I'm not like you carrying your 13 different sets up there. Up the I don't care. So I've got the same into. shirt. I, I, I do the whole Steve Jobs thing where you wear the same clothes every day. Okay, so, tell you, so the, what do you that, want? That was, that was only possible up there because uh, for kind of two things, I think. Um, I mean, obviously um your direction and our and our hard work meant that we had stuff to show but uh if the guys working with us hadn't been getting up every hour during the night to keep the generator going because if the air was so thin the generators kept stopping so the uh the kind of the local guys had to keep starting the generators for us otherwise we were completely going to miss any deadline at all 
Um, the second thing was Myra, the amazing kind of um, trek guide, camp guide that we had, fantastic woman. She kept providing Joe and I with um, with uh, Pisco tea, Pisco and lemon tea all yeah. through the night, which was a with very welcome. With local herbs. With lo with local, yes, very local herbs. It was um, yeah. Munya tea, wasn't it? Munya tea, yeah, which, is, amazing. Um, which helps settle your stomach and helps with the altitude, I think. And so we're having, you know, coca leaf tea, you know, uh, rum tea, Pisco tea, that sort of thing to keep us going whilst processing. But you can see the amount of laptops we've got going there. And literally we're loading data, processing it, registering it also that we can have you know something to show you on camera in the morning you know I, and if we didn't have anything to show what are we going to tell the entire production like sorry guys there's nothing to show <laughs> oh, we, we, oh, wow okay i mean the guy the, i mean the, you know i i don't often see the struggle until the next morning uh in the wasteland of of red bulls and everything that are lying around you guys but uh, you know, we've hiked in the context of this image, we've taken horses and pack mules and, and endless pelly cases and tents and, and food up to the top of this mountain, roughly 7,000 feet of elevation, 4,000 meters or so. Uh, it's been minus five degrees Celsius all night long. And you've got to deliver us a discovery, uh, overnight. How do you do that? What does it feel like? So first we start with the scanning. We have the LIDAR. So we put a LIDAR sensor on a on a helicopter. Can, can you guys just break down, you know, what the LIDAR sensor is doing and how we see beneath the trees so everybody can kind of get a clue of, you know, what's the secret sauce behind these discoveries? Yeah, absolutely. So in this circumstance, what we're doing is collecting high fidelity terrestrial LIDAR data. So LIDAR data captured from the ground. And that adds as like the ground truth, if you like, um, to our aerial data. And How we also obviously, pardon? Do you have an image? Do we have an image of the LIDAR sensor that's on the ground? It's behind um, Joe at the moment. <laughs> oh, yeah. This one. <laughs> oh, that one. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So this spins around in 360. Mm -hmm. and fires a laser up to a kilometer away right and so it's collecting meaningful spatial data of everything it can see and in the center it has a uh, essentially a laser which fires a laser at two million times a second through you know the bushes through trees and it's collecting points anywhere it can you know shine a light through essentially and as you move it around the landscape it builds up more of a picture and more of a picture of the entire landscape and then we tie all of those scans together in combination with the aerial scans captured from a drone and so we're literally capturing as complete data sets as possible all like tied together with high accuracy ground lidar and whilst we're capturing all of that data we're also capturing what's called photogrammetry data, which helps with, uh, you know, building these these the visual effects, the graphics in the end to recreate cities, and it captures essentially it captures high quality textural information. So it, you know, it looks photo real when we deliver the the scans. Yeah, the way and photogrammetry so, works is yeah. is like just so everybody knows the way that photogrammetry. Let's say I have this cup, right, and if I take a camera, even a very very old camera, this was my grandpa's camera. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay, this is my grandpa's camera. He was a reporter back. Uh, uh, he was one of the first uh, photojournalists uh, during uh, the wars in China a long time ago. This was his camera. So you take a bunch of pictures. Boom, 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 boom. Different angles. How many? How many pictures would you take of a single cup to create a photogrammetry model? Like two hundred, a hundred, a hundred or so. So boom, 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 all the way around. And then you've got all these overlapping images with different, uh, there you go, that's that's a much more advanced version of it, of these different angles of of a object, and you can rebuild a very accurate 3D model from all those overlapping images. What are we looking at here, Joe? So this is actually from my um, past career. Before we started Visual Skies, this is what I was doing with like camera technology for a company called Time Slice Films. And uh, this is like, this is, it's sort of from the wrong folder, I think, but uh, it was like one of the inspirations that, you know, got me thinking about, you know, how do I, you know, convert what we're doing on the ground with, you know, multiple DSLRs and capturing people and, and moving subjects, you know, to capturing landscapes with drone technology. You know, drones were starting to be become a thing in like 20, 2013, 2014. And I was building drones in the evening 
and then test flying them in the park in the mornings, you know, trying to find applications for drone technology in the visual effects world. And that's really when I met uh, Duncan whilst working at this company called Time Slice Films. And, uh, you know, he's, he inspired me to, you know, go out and capture landscapes. And then we started working together. Duncan's background was as a surveyor and an archaeologist uh, doing LIDAR scanning. And mine was obviously in the visual effects in industry, capturing visual effects shots with rigs like this and, um, and shooting photogrammetry. And we tied the two worlds together, essentially, you know, airborne devices with, with cameras and LIDAR sensors with ground, uh, you know, devices on the ground capturing, you know, high fidelity information. And that's really like, you know, our USP and uh, how we got started, essentially. Wow. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, I mean, the, the, the origin story of our team uh, after that, of us coming together too, is like, you guys were, you guys were starting here uh, and it was almost like the prediction for what would come with Lost Cities was being made in, in, in the sort of strings and in, in time that were, that were coming together as fate, right? Like, you know, like we were meant to yeah, do it's this de together. It's defi definitely fate. And I think <clears throat> without, without anyone sounding, trying, you know, without meaning to sound arrogant, but um, we're a kind of a unique combination that would be, we would struggle to, to do the same work if it was if if it was different people the thing about the thing that joe was talking about there with the the terrestrial and the aerial capture um of environments that's there's not one way of doing something and the terrain that we go to for the aman shoot and the um peru shoot or the mexico shoots they couldn't be more different right these you've got arid desert and you've got amazing fertile lush jungle so the same technology and the same combination of technology doesn't work for both of those locations so what we're constantly doing um is discussing and then using the most appropriate technology for what we're trying to find what we're trying to look for and that's why um you know we've we've brought in um technology that isn't normal within an archaeological perspective or indeed within a visual effects perspective so things like the the uh, the thermal imaging and the multispectral cameras and and some new technology that joe and i are very excited to show you which is airborne uh, data capture that can see through water into the bottom of the sea and so is this something new yeah we've got some new tech yeah we've got some new brand new uh oh, yeah, we got something new. It. Okay, we got. Oh yeah. my God, are you serious? We got a new piece of tech. We're going to reveal. I don't know. Should we even like? That seems a little bit NDA ish. Are we able to? No, I don't know. No, I want to. Like, should new... I check in with? It? Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, we're going to reveal <laughs> yeah, this. Good... Uh, the new tech. Yeah. So we've got a couple of things we got to reveal by the end of this podcast. The new technology of exploration that we're going to use. Uh, the I think the best discover one of the best coolest discoveries. I still don't know what it is. And then the third one is, uh, I'm hoping you could pull up. We, you you did a bunch of this scanning on me the last time I hung out with you guys in London, and I want to see if our uh, our virtual explorer. Yeah, you, you uh, nearly broke the lenses, Albert. It could hardly cope with uh, <laughs> the way your face okay. is, man. So where should we start? Should we start with the new tech? I mean, that's a big deal. Do we have a new toy that we're going to play with? Yeah, absolutely. It's just uh, it's brand new to the market, and we're we're hoping to get our hands on it soon. We haven't invented it, right? But uh, we'll be um, we'll be purchasing it and using it, uh, you know, uh, on your shows, hopefully, Albert. Um, but it's a it's it's a lidar sensor that um, you mount to a drone, and you can map um, uh, waterways and and you know seabeds with it up to a range of about forty meters, and this technology is is brand new like of our um out you know out this month essentially but i wish we had it when we were at in uh, navayam in israel because it would have been perfect for mapping those you know the uh, the beachfront um, the waterfront there in navayam so it's um, a new so laser we, that can yeah. punch through the water up to 40 meters so i think it's a combination of technology so you know when we when we were at, when joe and i were in israel with you we had to use two different techniques for you know on the on the on the on the beach side and the, the rock side and then under the water and this system uses a uh, different length laser different length light and different photogrammetric images and it instead of having to do kind of two surveys it's a system that will collect land and below the water so i mean it's going yeah, to be this incredible. is a big deal this is a big yeah, deal massive. because for me you know i i know that the the sea levels have rose and fallen at different times of humanity. Uh, our worlds exist at coastlines. They exist by water. 
And if we can start looking up to 120 feet below the water line, wow. What's I mean? Yeah, imagine imagine wow. how many in in the series we've done together, the two series we've done together. Imagine can remember how many important discoveries were actually in water or underwater. Remember in Acker when the sea was so rough that we couldn't get really at the underwater stuff for the citadel or uh, or uh, or in Israel the the boats and the the the, the anchor remains and everything else that's a really intensive underwater exploration that you were having to do if we could make that a safer exercise and cover bigger areas then that's got to be a good thing right yeah well we still got a ground truth like always right you do the scans and then we got to run into the jungle with a machete or we got to mount our scuba gear on and go and see what you found but the fact that we're going to be able to look that deep into the ground, uh, into underneath the water. Okay, everybody, you heard it here for the first time on this Suspection podcast. We're going to try so to look. Bigger, yeah? yeah, I mean, it just it just all of a sudden expands our search area by orders of magnitude. This is yeah, this right. is a big deal. Uh, and you waited till now to tell me this. I mean, look, we just needed <laughs> we we need a new show to work on, Albert. Oh, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Well, my mind is spinning right now, uh, yeah. you know, with the possibilities. Yeah. But that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. Uh, we got to talk offline after this because uh, our search list just went up. Uh, you know, we've got all the coastlines. Wow, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little shocked right now. Before, yeah. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, I don't know what to say right now because everything underwater has just all of a sudden opened up. I mean, of course, we could have in the past used things like side scan sonar, which we've done. Uh, we can, you know, all the different kind of acoustic work that we can do to look under the water. But absolutely. The, but lidar is our the thing, grounds, man. You yeah, know, I mean, the grounds. Yeah, sorry, come on. Go on, Albert. People, people tell. I, I ran into some uh, fans uh, not too long ago of our shows, and uh, and they said they they turned the show into a drinking game where every time I said lidar, they had to take a shot. I'm not saying that I encourage this at all, but you know, it, <laughs> I'm I'm not condoning this behavior. But Joe lidar, makes, Joe makes me do that in the office. Yeah, yeah. Well, lidar is the thing. You know, it's it to me, lidar has. Com- probably been as fundamental to archaeology as the microscope was to biology or the telescope was to astronomy, right? Like it it completely changes the game because all of a sudden you can delete the trees or the vegetation or now you can go through the water and you can see clearly what's what's beneath the veil of time, right? You can you can actually see the landscape as it was uh, when that version of humanity was playing out their story in that specific city, in that window of, of our journey. Uh, so, you know, all these different leaps of technology, they're, they're like keys to, uh, you know, a, a new, a new world of discovery that we can make. And now, you know, I'm just excited about what we do next. Cause I guess I gotta get my scuba gear ready. Oh man. Uh, Try not to drown foot. this time as well. Yeah, no, fill the tanks up with enough. Yeah. Air. Oh yeah. People don't know that. Okay, so that never made the episode, just so you know. But yeah, every, everybody, this last season, I almost uh, there was a mix up in the in the tanks and uh, and the gauges, and something got pretty squirrely, and uh, and the gauges weren't put on. You know, and we double checked everything, but they didn't get checked right. There was a big. I don't, there was there was something that went went wrong, and uh, and. Yeah, I am. Well, I things got. Yeah, I ran a. You know, there was there was the gauge was reading full, and there was no air in the tank, uh, and that was a scary moment. But you know, it was trumped by the moment that I was crushed under the boulder not too long after that. Yeah, it was so, a funny few days, wasn't it, Albert? Funny few days Albert, for you, Albert. What you actually did there was buy us more time, and it's very rare that we're not <laughs> going to be ready to present something on camera. But we weren't going to be ready to present something on camera. And then you I... had this, yeah, you, you had this tragic incident, which was terrifying, but it saved our backs. Because... <laughs> we were going, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awful. Uh... Yes. <laughs> yeah, you didn't wait, know wait. this. You didn't, you didn't know this, but uh, we didn't tell anyone at the time, but we got an extra day of processing because, you know, uh, you know, we had we had a rest day after that. The whole crew needed a rest day because, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, were a little well, bit I needed to get my did... foot, right? Like, I, I, you I need, you, yeah, you like didn't that... have a foot. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, wow. So I didn't know and that. You guys big, didn't tell me that was, part. 
it was because of that it was because of that that we were able to really look at the 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 under the water underwater data for that beach area and that's when joe saw all of the the uh, the, the holes the post holes of the harbor uh, structures and the inlets for the Canaanite boats and stuff. So it was kind of, it's one of those things, Joe and I have said this to each other, when we're sitting in airports worrying, it, it's, it's, we're always saying it's, it's one on one occasion it's not going to work, but it always seems to. And that well, was one you, of those so days where, where you well, maybe, I don't know, now I'm starting to wonder whether or not you guys, maybe, maybe yeah, you we guys, it. we rigged it. You, <laughs> we rigged yeah, it. Maybe you guys <laughs> made that boulder come loose just to buy extra time. That's pretty <laughs> messed up, guys. No, okay, so yeah, so again, just to fill everybody in, uh, that might not have seen the episode yet. I don't want to put a spoiler out there, but I guess we have to now. Um, you know, there is a moment in when we're in Israel where I get crushed under a boulder, you know, and it was very, very lucky that the boulder missed my my biological body, but it didn't miss me entirely and it crushed my prosthetic foot, uh, which was pretty shocking. It, I can't deny that this is a fundamentally scary moment. You know, to lose your leg again uh, is like, what? <laughs> what? But we, it turns we out... Saw the, uh, we, saw, we saw the faces of the crew who'd been out shooting with you. And I think in a weird way, you know, I mean, it was awful for you, obviously, and scary. and But you were in a weird way. You were kind of, you know, all right with it. You know, you, know, you came to terms with it pretty quickly. But some of the other crew were like completely in pieces at the, how close that was and how dangerous that was and how unpredictable these shows can be. And I think it underlined, you know, as if it needed underlining that when we go on these expeditions, we're so safety conscious, but you can't legislate for everything. You can't legislate for, for me getting malaria in Sudan. We can't legislate for rocks falling off and nearly crushing you and you know joe being really ill in sudan as well with giardio it's it's they are real expeditions they are really you know right right up against it right at the very limit of what you know we as people can do in many ways yeah you couldn't have said it better duncan you couldn't have said it better but you know the the question i think that people ask is why put yourself in harm's way i mean you guys are there with me you're there in the war zones you're there in the jungles you're amongst the deadly snakes we're flying in helicopters. We're with the, you know, we're with military sometimes in the jungles of Colombia. Who knows what we're doing? We're, you know, why, why do you guys, you, you have kids like I do, uh, you know, both of you. Why do we put for for me? I know why, but for you, why do why is it worth it to put your life on the line? Yeah, I actually have a, um, a very a good pair of images that uh, articulates this very well. This was my first day on. Uh, on Lost Cities, um, Micronesia. And so what what's happening there is I'm overheating, you know, I'm, I'm downloading data, you know, praying it's going to work and, you know, really just like, you know, tired. I was up the entire night after traveling for 40 hours to get to Namadol because our main drone didn't show up. So I had a backup drone in completely in pieces. So I had to build an entire entire drone throughout the night after traveling for two and a half days or whatever it was. And then and then work all day, obviously scanning. And, you know, we're down, downloading the data and I'm sort of thinking this is this is, you know, a bit too crazy. This is too much. And the sweetest little girl comes over to me. Let me change images. So comes over and brings me a fan. <laughs> and it was just such a magical moment, you know, such a relief to, you know, somebody saw me struggling and, you know, just sort of wanted to help me out a little bit. And uh, and it was just like, you know, it, was, it really just made everything worthwhile to me. And, you know, it, as it just sort of said to me as a team, you know, uh, we can we can we can do it you know if we collaborate to get together as a team and we all we all like you know sort of come together and work hard and do our bits as well as possible you know because that's our mine and duncan's job you know we, we, what we're there to do is to collect meaningful useful data that you know sh shows something you know finds lost cities finds you know uh, the pyramids finds this and you know, it's it's all about the support from one another and the support you had in Israel after, you know, the boulder coming off. And it just, uh, you know, it was a really special moment for me. And, uh, you know, it really just sort of like, you know, 
it was the magical moment that you know it was like yeah this is really cool and i love working on the show and i love the people that we wow. meet and, yeah. i love that story joe i mean so this it, the kindness showed by a, a young girl in the island of micronesia to just bring you a fan on our first field expedition together uh, yeah, I, changed I can't everything, speak the local language. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I can't speak the local language, of course. And you know, she, I don't think she could speak English. But she just saw me sitting there, you know, struggling, you know, in the in the heat. So I'll show you the previous image again. <laughs> it's <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was, let's see it again. It was, let's see the smile one more time. The smile. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I literally thought I was going to. Uh, I was going to overheat through exhaustion, and uh, you know, this sweet little girl brings me a uh, brings me a fan. It was it was just such a magical moment for me. And, it was one of yeah. the one of the let's hottest, see, let's see hottest and sweatiest places you've ever seen. But, but, but let's let's see. So but do you have one more image? There's another image I know that exists of you. Uh, uh, both of I think both of you probably scanning on a boat in Amador. So if we can give a context of what it's like to actually be doing the scans, not just you know sitting with your fan i think both joe and i in a way underestimated uh you know how tough these expeditions would be um i mean i was professional archaeologist for 25 years i've uh been around the world been lots of archaeological projects and so when the when i was talking to mike slee and paul cook and the people for the first series i was just massively excited about the prospect of going to new places um and then as the, as the series started and we started filming them and it became apparent that it was actually really, really hard work, like proper hard graft, you know, not nice hotels, not, not fancy food, nothing. Sometimes, you know, really just living a, a hermit-like desolate lifestyle. But by that stage, we'd grown as a team. We'd met you, we'd become friends, we'd met the crew who shoot these things, the enormous number of people who put all of their amazing professionalism into the research and the sound and the camera guys and girls and everything about it becomes like a family. We've we've said this, and it, and it might sound like a cliche, but the reason that Joe and I continue to do this is because we are family. We are friends. You are you know, my closest, Joe and you are my closest male friends in the whole world. I wouldn't ever, I would be so distraught if I uh, couldn't go on whatever happens next or whatever we do next, because, you know, we we make, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, but we make each other better. I think you're you're a better presenter because of what we give you. We, we work harder because we don't want to let you down. All of that is, um, I'm getting emotional now, actually. It's incredible to, to feel that support of everyone there there's no neg ferrets there's no one being negative at all everyone is is doing the right thing saying the right thing and and being the most supportive people that i've ever had the pleasure to meet with and that's that's why we continue doing it what a what a thing to reflect on you know i'm so uh, the gratitude of it all right like these have not been jobs these have been life journeys each one of them um you know and when you look into the eyes of the local communities at the end of the day and you see in them uh an empowerment in the data or in the discovery an empowerment that reflects their relationship to their own identity um you know that 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 makes it all worth it, right? Like probably for me, you know, some of the more recent expeditions, like when we were in Sudan and we were with Iklas and seeing her cry when we realized that all those pyramids were surrounded by uh, an ancient version of the Nile, you know, like that in the time when they're in the midst of a war, a civil war uh, and, and fighting for their own identity, it makes you realize that, hey, what could be more like what really what could be more important than trying to look back and, and dive into the depths of our of our own identities at this moment in time. Right. I think for me, the friendship amongst this team has been, like you said, this profound experience. But look at that right there. You've got an entire community in Sudan witnessing a moment where their world is being revealed, you know, in terms of their ancient world their ties to the Kushites who have been, for the most part, overlooked in history. Yet now, millions of people around the world are going to see their story. Um, I couldn't be more grateful. You know, this has been wildly 
we're going to have to do a multi-part uh, podcast here, I think, because, you know, we definitely have to keep going. We've got, I think we've been going for almost an hour now, and I wish we had like a million hours, but I know that, I know that there's, um, everybody that's listening to this podcast might have to get to work at some point, you know? <laughs> I don't know what you think. Wait, hold it, hold it, pull that away for a second. Okay, uh, so there's a couple of things I wanted to end with before we go, and, and I want to go to a, this is again part one of a multi-part series of podcasts with you know all different guests, but I want you guys to be um, back with me again because this is this is the dream team. I mean, I always call us a dream team. So there's two, maybe three things. First of all, I want you guys to sing the lidar song. <laughs> oh no! Come on, man! <laughs> you can't do, do that to us. They gotta do it. No. You guys gotta do it. Okay, I'll, I'll no, start us off. Right? Same, we'd have to be in the same place to do that. That's, we that's light that's our in the morning. <laughs> Wait, no. how's it going? No. Come on, that's come not on. it, man. Give that's it to me. It, Give it to me. Man. We need a few more coca leaf teas to get no, no. started. I'm afraid. Three, two. <laughs> Are you guys uh, really going to leave me hanging here? Come on. Is... Well, you know, we're, we're disappointed it never made it into the episode, you know. Well, that's yeah, your that's chance. Come on. Give me the LiDAR song. <laughs> oh, man. I'll, I'll cut you in. Three, two, one. Well, what do you reckon, one. Duncan? You go for it. I'll do it. Okay, go hey. on. Count us in, Albert. Three, C- two, count us in. one, and... If I if had a LiDAR, I'd LiDAR, 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 LiDAR in the morning. I'd LiDAR in the evening. All, all over, over this, this land. land. <laughs> That's all you're getting. That's yeah. all you're getting. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll tell you what. For the next for the next podcast, I'm gonna learn the guitar version of this song, and we're gonna go all the way through it. Okay. Thank you for that. And that's 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 a big part of the the Lost City's future is the lidar song. We got to make that in. Number two, uh, I, I and I want to know. Uh, I want I want you to tell briefly the story of your your one of your greatest new employees and how she actually got part of the visual skies team because of lost cities. I'll, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do a brief version, a relatively brief version. So yeah, yeah. Okay. I won't, I won't, I won't. So, um, so visual skies is made up of, um, uh, you know, people from all different backgrounds, um, archaeologists and architects and visual effects artists and everything else. So you know, we we're kind of a a real kind of family of uh, multidisciplinary family, right? And a multilingual family, which is relevant in this case because um, our co- our colleague Lydia Fauser, who's a German woman, uh, actually saw knew nothing about visual skies, knew nothing about work in England, but saw Albert, Joe, and Duncan on National Geographic. Uh, doing amazing things with drones and LIDAR and everything else and said, I want to work with those guys. And she literally packed a bag, left Germany, came to England and said, I want to work with you guys. And we're like, well, we're going to have to at least, okay, yeah, let's see kind of thing. And she's been amazing. She's picked up. She was. She's yeah. very talented anyway, even before she came, but she's now fully qualified drone pilot she does you know she does basically the jobs that we do and she collected a lot of the data for the scottish episode in this series too so she and ross went with the with the director ben before the show shot when we were all there and, and she did a lot of she worked just as hard as joe and i do when we're there she did running up and down those kind of pictish mountains collecting incredible data in the most awful weather actually i think we actually had it pretty good by comparison but yeah, right, so, so, Lydia so Fowler, that, there you hear Lydia it, everybody. Fowler's if if if, if if uh, if anybody out there is looking for a job, call Joe and Duncan right now, and uh, and they'll get you in the Lost City team. Uh, it's it's all, funny. All it's joking actually aside. the same way. Oh, sorry, Albert, but it's actually actually the same way that I got my first job as well. Is and so that's why I was so you know inspired to work with her. Was that, you know she uh, she saw something on on TV and applied for you know just hit us straight up you know and just said guys that was fantastic i love your work on lost cities i'd love to you know just get to know you and you know see what you what you do and uh and uh, she came all the way from germany to the uk um to uh, you know on a two-week trial to see whether she would you know like living in london for example and uh, and started working with us and it was fantastic but that's exactly the same way as you know i did my first job but uh, you know i didn't have to travel into another country to do that 
but I saw a YouTube video was inspired and applied, you know, hit up the uh, owners of the company. You know, I think it's, you know, that sort of go get it attitude that uh, we all have, obviously. And, uh, you know, we, we, we hope the rest of our team have and uh, Lydia is, uh, does fantastic. Oh, we'll make we'll make sure that we get uh just check just make sure that we have her consent to keep you know to tell her story on this podcast before we keep it in the edit. She's, but, she's sitting in the office and she can hear me, so I'm pretty sure she's happy. Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> well, if she gives the thumb, is she giving you the thumbs up? Yeah, thumbs up. Okay, good, good. Really? She's we'll make sure, but we'll make <laughs> yeah, sure before we publish up. this. But but yeah. it gets back to the theme <laughs> of of I think one of the main themes of this podcast. Uh, one of the themes is that. A single image or a single a single example of something can change the course of someone's life or anybody's, you know, or, or, or a civilization, right? So for me, it was an image of a guy surfing uh, with a prosthetic that got me out of the hospital. Uh, for you, it was a video on YouTube that started your career. And for Lydia, I'm so grateful that uh, Lost Cities had an impact on her life as well. And now she's actually out in the field with us at times. I mean, that's an incredible full circle story. Um, the video I saw on YouTube was actually a surfing video as well, Albert. That, uh, yeah, that started me off. It was a, a video for Rip Curl where they used multiple cameras to film surfers from multiple angles and edited what's called a time slice moment. And I saw it and it was like magic. It was something I'd never okay, seen before. Well, let's do that. Let's do that exact thing that you just said, uh, but have it be but with where, you. I'm just, where I'm just getting destroyed by a wave because I... We can For do me, that. my, my can surfing, do that. I love surfing, but it's not exactly always fun in games. I mean, a lot of times I'm getting just destroyed in these matches. <laughs> so we'll get it in full time slice. It'll be like, ooh, okay. That'd be awesome. Uh, Let's do it. Let's make it happen. And then and then the last bit before we go, uh, I told everybody at the beginning that we'd show them something of the last, you know, maybe our favorite discoveries. For me, I've got one in mind. I don't know if, if you guys have anything in mind of your favorite discovery on the series. Do you have anything in mind? Oh, you yeah, put me I on the spot. You, I you go, I'll, let, I'll let you think of it for a joke. Let's see if you can narrow it down and stuff. Um, I think the I think we've alluded to it, but the Mexico episode was absolutely magical, uh, and and it's funny because it came full circle because um, for for reasons too complicated to go to on this podcast, Mexico was the only place Joe and I went to a year before with covid and everything else that happened but we went to, to kind of do a recce and collect some data the year before and it was uh, through no fault of the people no fault of the location it was really tough really really tough and we had serious misgivings about that episode and then we were going to go back and film it as the first episode and it ended up being the last one and that gave us you know a, a perspective a bit of a distance between those two and so when we went to Mexico with you for the filming, right at the end of the series two shoots, um, everything seemed to click. Everything went perfectly. It was amazing. And uh, we collected data in areas that previously we thought it was going to be impossible. So we were we were we were actually able to get in data, whereas, you know, on the recce, it looked really sketchy that we would get anything uh, on this astonishing lake doing his amazing work and then when we did the processing and did the reveals and looked at them the the genuine enthusiasm of the archaeologists and the locals was was like just you know incredible heart heart rending i was going to say but just like really really made me proud of what we'd all done together because um we we found some amazing stuff that that blew the archaeologist's mind even even areas where they'd been working before and they thought they understood we completely revolutionised their views on those on those locations, and that that was incredible. I mean, my the, my personal most beautiful moment was just on the top of a pyramid in Nuri in Sudan. I think that, uh, or on the top of Jebel Barkal in Sudan. Those those locations were just magical, and it was even more yeah, even more special because of how difficult Sudan is as a country to go to. This, this Mexico image that we're seeing right now, and the one that you're talking about, is from the latest uh, series that we've put out there. It's called Lost Cities Revealed. Uh, this expedition took place in Chiapas, uh, and it's a story of origins. And we'll show it in a minute. I, in a minute, I want to pull up the data, but not not just yet. Uh, there's one piece in particular that I still don't quite understand. This is a jungle where the Lacadan Maya still live. Uh, the and they you know they still speak uh, Lacadan Maya. They in the translations that we were able to receive through this incredible uh, 
um, anthropologist, um, you know, we were able to see that they they believe that all things had a soul. The trees had a soul. The rock had a soul. And as we traveled across this magical jungle landscape, we started through the data seeing that there was a timeless connection to the people that lived there back to the very beginnings of the Maya. And there's one image in particular that just still, I can't figure out what it is because I haven't seen it in other sites across the Maya. Okay, Joe, what about you? What do you got? What's your favorite discovery? Yeah, I've, I've got to echo what um, Dunk was saying, actually. Um, you know, I've just this image for me was really special. It's, um, you know, I've been flying over these guys, uh, these Lacandon Mayans uh, homes, essentially, for the park for like almost almost two weeks, right? With, with my drone that you can see folded up there. Capturing data from all angles, essentially flying robots through the sky you know, mapping this location from the sky because it's easier to do than on foot, right? And this is their homes. And what I was, you know, whilst capturing the data, I was also processing it. And I taught taught these two kids how to use a mouse and uh, got to show them a map of their home, essentially, you know, out in the field. And they were learning how to use a mouse and look at, you know, this 3D map of their home. And they were really getting into it and looking all over the place and being like, oh, that's where this place is. That's where the, you know, the uh, clandestine um, uh, fishermen come. And, you know, they're you know, they telling me all this different stuff. And uh, it was just such a special moment for me. And it was so, you know, rewarding to be able to reveal, uh, you know, a 3D world that exists inside a computer screen you know, to these guys, like, you know, captured with robots that fly through the sky. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's just so incredible to be able to do that. And uh, yeah, it's much easier to do with drones, obviously, than on foot. But these guys, you know, are the masters of this land. You know, they walk everywhere barefoot and, you know, there's crocodiles in the lake, you know, and, you know, one year olds just walking around like as as happy as anything. And, you know, it really meant something to me, you know, when being there because, you know, I my kid was one years old at the same time. And I, uh, you know, meet uh, Freddie's at the uh, Freddie at Freddie's bar, and meet meet meet, meet Freddie's wife, and uh, you know, discuss what we were doing in the day, you know, capturing this location, cap capturing that location, and their kids were just there, you know, playing around and and you know, living in this you know incredible environment and thriving, you know, they're doing so well. And, and uh you know we struggle duncan and i struggle like you know every day it's it's tough in this location and you know they're, they're you know looking at us like we're you know we're soft essentially but, yeah, uh, yeah yeah well we are we are a little stuff. soft compared to them they're they're pretty tough those kids you know they you know their their relationship to the jungle is is one that i was blown away by you know just the fact that they could they would take a vine and they would chop the vine and drink the water out of a vine or, uh, you know, the, the, the way that they walked across the jungle and, you know, they could see like, like anything that I grabbed onto was just like, you know, it would hurt, right? It was like the zillion spikes going into your hand, but they just somehow instinctually moved through the jungle in a way that, I don't know, you know, they were, it showed that they, their community and their world was born from the jungle. Now, what we're looking at right here in this image is a very special mountain. Chak Aktun, the Red Mountain. And this will lead us into the final part of this podcast, this, this you know, what I hope is many podcasts with you guys. Uh, when we did the LiDAR scan of this mountain and we r removed the trees digitally, what revealed itself was the exterior of the mountain, which is pretty, pretty mind-blowing. But as we descended, as, a, you know, I went down into the heart of the mountain with... Um, this incredible uh, rock climbing archaeologist uh, who we're actually going to get to podcast interview uh, in another episode here. Uh, inside the heart of the mountain, we, we found evidence of the earliest Maya. But when we look at the outside, let's pull up that LiDAR scan of the outside real quick. When we look at the outside without the trees there, what we start to see is that the whole mountain has been shaped, can we zoom in a little bit on the red tip there, into a giant pyramid. Now, can you, do you want to point out the, the details here of what we're looking at? 
Yeah, this is essentially a hype map, uh, but um, in 3D of uh, the mountain we were just looking at and various other parts without the, the trees on it. So you can see in the previous uh, image we showed, there is an, a full of an ancient forest that hasn't been touched for two and a half thousand years. You know, the densest forest like we've ever seen. You know, it's impossible to walk through in parts. Um, and right at the top of that mountain, you can just about make it out in this image, is a carved landscape, almost like a pyramid, tabletop mountain that has been hand carved and then steps leading down to the south. It's a little bit hard to make out in this image, but there are essentially 13 steps or so, right, Albert, that have been hand ter terrace steps. Like That's big right. steps, that have like been platform hand like this. Hand carved. Right. Yeah. Not, not steps just... like walking up a staircase, but like no, steps like no, the whole no. mountain is stepped like a, like a Maya pyramid. Yeah, and then to the left of the image, it's uh, again a bit hard to make out, but um, there are. Oh, am I jumping ahead, Albert? I'm about to re reveal something that's. Uh, yeah, yeah. Be. Let's save that for the very end. But just th oh, so okay. then those big holes, those big holes there. What are those? Let's tell you what They're those cenotes, are. Cenotes, cenotes, but they are uh, man-made cenotes, and so it's really easy to see in in the uh, cenote to the right. There's a man-made uh, wall that would. Um, I'm not actually sure what the reason for it is. That you know, m my expertise. That's the limit of my expertise. But I imagine it was you know to hold fish, right? To uh, to, um, or, you know, possibly. I mean, this I is a ceremonial. This is this feels like a ceremonial because what we see at the very top is a large. An, a large sh uh, temple shrine thing at the very tip of the mountain, but but those those cenotes they were either quarries is what the archaeologists described to us, or the water themselves, like the the actual the the idea of a cenote and the water itself is a portal to the underworld, to uh, Shabala. It's a it's a portal to the primordial underworld where the spirits come and where they go, uh, and this this mountain at the very tip actually has a tiny little entrance, a hole. Uh, and in that hole, it drops down into the heart of the mountain. And wherever the mountain is picking up the wind from either other areas of the side of the mountain uh, that comes across that lake, every time you stand and lean over the tip of, you know, the, the, that little hole, the, the, almost like the mouth of the top of the mountain, the wind from inside the belly of the mountain fills itself in you know fills the belly of the mountain and then and then it pushes your hair back and and it's like the mountain's breathing on you it's it's unbelievable and in the heart of that cave there uh that's for another podcast with our Chelly, but we see uh we do see ancient pottery from the remains of you know the the rituals or whatever that was down there but Yo, you were about to get at something that's pretty mind blowing. Uh, not only was this mountain shaped as a as a giant stepped pyramid, but it was probably what did, what did, what do they say the dates were? The archaeologists they said that the dates to this go back to the pre like to earliest days of the of the Maya, that what they call the pre classic. And in the pre classic, there were still these experiments going on in terms of architecture. But there's one in particular that just just was so weird. And can you uh, sort of describe that, Joe, and maybe point to it? I got another close-up of it coming up right after this. But uh, Yeah. I just wanted to ask real quick, Albert, you, you went diving in one of these cenotes. Did you did you find anything in, when you went diving? Yeah, you can actually see the edge of... Uh, you can see the walls of these large cut bits of limestone of where they had, they had sort of carved out the sides of this cenote. And you can see from the top here how kind of, you know, circular they are. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're designed. Um, Rather you than me diving in Yeah, there. pretty There's creepy though, because yeah. <laughs> crocodile, there was a lot of, there was crocodile eggs. There was actually a nest with crocodile eggs right next to the cenote. Uh, That's as exactly we're where you it. don't want to dive. <laughs> right? Like what? You know, and then, and then the whole time, you know, the archaeologist is like, yes, we're going into the underworld. I'm like, what? You know, he's like, yes, the spirit underworld where the dead are. And it's like, um, okay. 
Okay, okay. So point out the thing that's in this image that So is... yeah, we we were we were scanning this for, you know, weeks on end essentially. It's one of the hardest landscapes to scan um just because of the way the mountain like limits your view of the drone and the vertical aspect it means that the drone has to stay at an equal height to the landscape and you can see in this image it's the ch height is changing constantly so we're in a boat going all around this mountain you know struggling to maintain eyesight but this one time we downloaded some of the data and we saw you know a triangular structure where there definitely shouldn't be one and uh, I asked the archaeologists on, uh, that were there, Joel and Santiago. Joel Polka. Yeah. Joel, Joel Polka, by the way, is, uh, just so everybody knows, he's the he's kind of like a, a guru of Maya archaeology, one of the early legends of Maya archaeology. Uh, and he, we we're honored that he opened up this world to us, where he has for a long time believed that this lake and this lake system might hold um, what he refers to as the the axis mundi the the of the maya cosmo vision their their origin city possibly the city of of matwil the the sacred origin city of palenque and he's really an expert you know this incredible guy and also santiago uh who was another uh mexican archaeologist uh of maya descent uh you know we were there with them and when they see this data what do they point out yeah, so as I was saying, me and Duncan spot like this triangular structure where there shouldn't be one. And if you, I don't know if you can make it out, but just on the left, if you go perfectly left from from the red center, just keep going left. Uh, I don't know whether it's crops, but on the left hand side here, you can see a triangular structure, which to us looks like a pyramid. Okay, and, and I got uh, the next image, uh, Bear. See, okay, so everybody just look there. You see, you see that you get this huge. You, this huge triangle of the mountain on the right, and then over on the left in the little island, the inlet of land there, there's a, a slightly light blue dot there. Uh, and if you look closely, what is that? So, this is in the middle of mangroves, you know, that's where all of the noise around it is coming from. It's mangroves and water. And as we know, you know, LIDAR doesn't, well, in the past doesn't work very well with water, right? And uh, the water level in this lake goes up and down. And uh, for us, we were a little bit unlucky because the water level was actually super high when we were there the second time. And um, so that's where the sort of noise around comes from. But in the center, we've got this triangular structure, which um, when speaking to Joel and Santiago, they said triangular pyramids don't exist in the Mayan in the Mayan like, world. And uh, we were asking them, well, what is this? And they had no idea. And it was hopefully an incredible discovery. Uh, we're yet to find out what it is. There we go. There's a side angle. Zoom in again on that one. Okay, so you know, we don't have a scale bar here, but how tall is this structure? This is big. Yeah, this is, you know, uh, like 50 meters uh, across. And so I imagine around uh, ooh, uh, like, I'm guessing here. I would need to uh, pull up the scan, but I, I'd imagine it's like 20 meters high. Yeah, I would say it's about, it's about 20, 20 vertically and getting on for 40 or 50 on its longest dimension. <clears throat> and and the thing is, so much, even though the, the vegetation was so um, dense over the whole of that landscape, in other parts, we were getting very clear indications of, of, of archaeology that joel and santiago were expecting so classic and pre-classic mayan type architecture uh and the, the technology that we were using the combination of the aerial photogrammetry and the aerial lidar was giving us good results so there's absolutely no reason for us to believe that this is you know an error in the data this is kosher this is exactly a structure that exists and that no one had seen before and no one knew about and no one can interpret. So your your converse, comments earlier about the ground truthing, that's something that really has to be done because this could be, and you know, incredible. This could change change early pre-classic Mayan um, architectural styles completely. Yeah, We've had well, this let's wait. We, we can't. Times. Yeah, we can't say that. And you know, we, we've got to let the archaeologists define that. Just so let's let Santiago work. sort of figure out what it is. But we, 
but we, but you're right. We've had this comment like, a few times. Sorry, but we've had this uh, comment a few times in the past where you know we uh, on your show we go to a location, we do loads of scanning, and we do a big reveal, and the archaeologists turn around and we go, "Great, now I've got 50, 50 years more work to do here." Thank you guys. You know, but that you exactly what you're saying, Albert. They have to you know ground truth this stuff. We're essentially you know pointing out shapes in a in 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 a in a two two D or three D map. You know they, they yeah, need to go yeah. and tell us exactly what it is. We tried to get there, uh, but unfortunately the data didn't get processed until the night before we were to leave. Uh, and also this jungle has um, some razor sharp cacti that were actually placed there. Uh, well, not cacti, but uh, what was that one plant? Do you remember that plant that had like the ah uh, the lawyer plants? Are they called oh. lawyer plants or something like yeah, that? Yeah, like they were like they were like a bunch of machetes sticking out of the ground. Yeah, and uh, they use they were as, lights. green razor. They use as a defense system, aren't they, to protect sites so you can't like climb up a rock face and. Yeah, and, the, Mayan, the Mayans know, just, planted them to stop to stop invaders being able hundreds to of years ago, thousands of years ago. They yeah. they put these plants in as a re, as a as a as a barrier to um you know to their enemies, and uh, and they're still there. So uh, it's pretty hard to get through. But this strange structure, roughly what seventy feet or so tall, uh, you know, and what did you guys say lengthwise? Uh, uh, so it's about 120, 100, 120 meters. Sorry, 100, yeah, 120 feet. feet 120 sorry. feet long. You know, it's a it's a triangle, and the, and it's come from the earliest days. If it is what we think it is, if it is actually a, a Maya structure, it's of the earliest days of the Maya, and uh, and it just what well, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is we can't make a conclusion about this yet. This is for the archaeology community to figure out, but. This kind of data, and let's go, we can pull away from it for a minute now. This kind of data that we're able to find and, and you know, and many times ground truth, they open up more questions than they answer, right? Like it's about discovery, but the discovery process is, it's, it's like opening a Pandora's box. It just opens up more questions. And that's the best kind of science. That's the best kind of exploration. You know, and with a tool like LIDAR or with a tool like ground penetrating radar or satellite imagery or any of these other things, they're just new windows into these unknown worlds that have been forgotten, left in the jungle, left for thousands of years. But those stories hidden in that weird enigmatic image of a triangle, they tell the story of the beginning of a people that emerged from the jungle. And whether it's a jungle or it's a desert in Sudan or a mountain you know, somewhere else in, in Peru, it's a story that we instinctually all share because we are human, right? Like whether you're a, a Maya or a, a Inca or you're from the Great Wall of China, we all have lived these different versions of humanity and they're all part of the same, we're all part of the same human journey. Uh, so, you know, I just love, I just love that this is what we do uh, for, I don't even want to call it work uh, because it isn't work. It's, it's just the, it's like the dive into the curiosity of our own mirror, the mirror of ourselves. And, you know, I we got to wrap this, unfortunately, because it's already been way longer than uh, than I think we were expecting. But, guys, I I miss you both. Um, is there any last thoughts you guys have, last words before we sign off But between now and the next? No, just can't wait for Lost Cities uh, Season 3 to uh, start production. That's what we're really excited about. And, uh, yeah, just be be with you guys and uh, be with the team again get the old team back together It'd be fantastic to go and discover more lost cities with you let's hope it happens uh it hasn't been nothing's been decided yet but either way i'm gonna find you guys and grab that new technology the underwater lighter we heard about for the first time today here on this podcast uh and let's let's ask more questions yeah, you know it's, that's it's what fantastic this is all about that these that there's never a line drawn under all of this, Albert. You know, it, we yeah, like you said, it it just branches out. There's more and more. The more we find and the more we work on, the more we work together, the more the technology develops, the more those windows into the past uh, open up. And that, and like you said, it teaches us about ourselves. It teaches us about humanity. It was a privilege to meet people like Iklas in Sudan and, you know, the, the, the guys we've met all over the world just you know stunning not not just the experts but also the the locals and the behind the camera crew we 
you know, had an amazing drone pilot working with us in Israel called Moore. And th these people are just such characters, such rich characters, and they, they, they enrich our lives. I'm definitely, you know, it sounds corny, but I'm definitely a better person for having done all of this work with you guys. It's, it's you know, it's life affirming. So Thanks next so much, time, Robert. next time on the podcast with you guys, we'll we'll talk about all the other crazy discoveries we're about to make. But also, uh, I want to see that virtual, uh, the virtual version of <laughs> for the video. Yeah, game. Don't you think one's enough? <laughs> well, <laughs> We've got you a know, virtual one as well. <laughs> we're going to send you running in the jungle with, where you can't actually get hurt, and you know you can run straight through oh, those uh, lawyer plants, and you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. What's the fun of that? Digital version. <laughs> What's the fun yeah, of that? So. Well, thank you guys. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you all the people that have been part of this experience, from the crews to the local communities. Thank you everybody. Let's. I. I'm going to press you guys to end this and send everybody off with one final take of our lidar song. You know, you guys, you half asked no it way. last time. Let's just get it better. Just, just the first verse. Oh god! With, with a bit of chorus. Come on, put a little bit of chorus into it. Sorry, I've got, I've got a connection problem. Oh, you're breaking out, out in the morning. You're breaking out. You can't hear you. Can't hear you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Till next thanks time. So much, Albert. Signing Thanks, Albert. Signing out. Take care, buddy. Bye.